Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Razy Men Show, and I'm your host, Craig Carlisle, and on the phone, we've got a great man of God, a great person, great all around, just real dude, Stefan Gautreaux. You out there, Stefan? I'm here. Well, that's Thanks a, for having me. Oh, man, this is, I'm very, very thankful for you for, for joining, because, you know, like we were saying off air, you know, this is what that we do this is what the lord wants it's, it's his show it's it's he's the one that's driving he's actually the host i'm just an empty vessel and a talking head here on the radio you know yep that is all that is all we're supposed to do I let him flow through us that's it that's it i'm very excited so we're going to talk about your background tell me a little bit more about you because i i know you as stefan gertro from ripple effect 22 and i have heard rumor that you've been you know been an art athlete and you know, so share with the people your a little bit about yourself. All right. Um, so, born and raised in San Francisco, California. Um, just, I had a passion for baseball since I was a little kid. My dad helped uh, stoke that fire, and um, so <clears throat> I played professional baseball for nine years. Played with the um, with the White Sox and with the Braves. So. Chicago White Sox and Atlanta Braves. Um, baseball has taken me quite a bit of places. I uh, was able to go to the University of San Francisco, um, graduated from there, um, played in different countries. It's, uh, it's been really cool. Played with, had some really great teammates, played with some Hall of Famers, <laughs> some future Hall of Famers. So it was, uh, it's pretty crazy to, like, to be in that atmosphere and arena for nine years it was it was a great ride but uh you know what it, when god has other plans for you, you you gotta you better follow him or you're gonna get in trouble basically <laughs> you better preach on that right there now help me understand I, I i was a kid who well we've all been kids right so <laughs> i played baseball as a kid and i loved to play the sport didn't care much for watching the sport but my parents dad particularly told me you know what there are no athletes in my house that play professionally, so you're not going to even do that. So, how did you? Obviously, your dad, you said, stoked that fire. How did you even yeah. know that you wanted to play? What position did you play? And how did you really find that baseball was something that you thought of that you wanted to, pr- to pursue? Um, I, there's like uh, key moments in my life when things like kind of shifted and changed, where I was like, oh wow, I could actually do this. Um, first. I'd say my mom uh, kind of forced my dad to stoke that fire when I was in <laughs> when I was about three or four years old. So I started t-ball really early. Right. And um, we we were at a, the local park, park and rec team, and my mom dropped me off at practice, and she saw the coach in his car. Oh. This is remember this is with kids who are like six, five to six, and mm-hmm. I was three or three or four. And he was in his car drinking a beer, smoking a cigarette before practice. Wow. And so she sees that. And right when she sees that, she's like, you know what? Stefan's not playing for this team. So she talks to my, my dad, and she goes, uh, you're going to be coaching him. And my dad's like, what? <laughs> and wow. so my dad starts, yeah, my dad starts coaching. He uh, learned the information that to start a team. And we uh, started a park and rec team out of my uh, – out of my uh, kindergarten or my elementary school where I was going, which happened to be a Christian school and was a part of our church. Okay. So we just started a uh, team out of the church. And I think that that was like the first thing that stoked the fire because when he was putting into, like pouring into these kids that were a part of our team, because he coached for, for about three, four years. Mm-hmm. Till I was, well, let's see, oh, five years, because it was till I was in sixth grade. And he, um, he he learned the game. Like he he was a huge fan of the game, but he really learned about like coaching. Read all the books, and I I became the beneficiary of like all the knowledge he was getting because he would take me to like these co- these coaches conferences and all this other stuff. And so I would learn a lot because I was just like I wanted to play. But then it was like I was also learning a skill and and the mechanics of the game as well. Sure, w- which was getting me a little bit above everybody else. And um, so when my when my dad stopped coaching me, uh, the thing that switched because I, I had had my dad coach me forever and I wasn't used to anybody else, so I didn't really know how to uh, 
if I wanted to keep playing because I was like, I have baseball without my dad. It's not, the, it's not baseball. Yeah, yeah. But uh, one of my um, one of my friends, he was going to a, a he was signing up for a baseball team, and I was actually hanging out at his house, and his mom was like, "You want to sign up?" And I was like, "I don't know." And so she called my parents and I'm like, "Hey, we'll sign him up." So they signed him, they signed me up, and without that, I probably would have stopped playing when I was in I think I was fifth grade. I would stop playing in fifth grade just because my dad wasn't my coach. Now, why did your dad not? What was he not going to be your coach at that point in your life? So we he had to work. We had uh, for our, in the beginning it was me, and my sister, mm-hmm. but then my brother came. Oh, he's seven years younger than me. I've seen him so ruin everything. My dad huh? picked up extra shifts. <laughs> he worked at Bar Barrier Rapid Transit or worked. He just recently retired. Got it. So. It was it was pretty funny because like he, he had to keep working. My mom got sick a little sick at the during the time of my uh, brother's pregnancy and everything. So it was it was pretty. So he was he wasn't able to spend the time to actually coach. So I was like, well, I guess I'm done. And with, if it wasn't for my friend and his mom just saying, hey, you should play. Like let's just sign you up. I probably would have stopped at fifth grade. And so then I started playing with guys that I didn't know in front of people who I didn't really know mm. and then people were like wow you're really good and then that it started hitting me I was like am I better than other people you know it never really hit me right that it, like I was a little bit better than other kids and I remember the time that it really sunk in was I was a part of an all-star team uh that played in this Memorial Day tournament and we played against a team in uh from Mexico uh-huh. oh wow and yeah they were really good they were boat racing like all these other uh, kids like the other teams and uh, beating them by the mercy rule and everything wow. mercy rule is beating them by 10 <laughs> and and so we came in it was a championship game I ended up pitching and um, I hit two home runs wow uh, and we won three to two I pitched the complete game and after that I realized I was like you know what? I could really do this because I was like, without me on that field, we would have lost. And I was just, I was responsible for two of the three runs that we had, sure. and I was able to keep them at two. So I was just like, okay, like I could do this. And I think that was, when, I think I was in seventh grade then. And when that happened, I was just like, I really, really want to do this. Well, that's and amazing. Yeah. So it just became a focus. Uh, the cool part about the focus of of the game was that it really contributed to my successes in other areas, like in school and academics, just because I was really focused on making sure I played baseball. And I I learned that I had to have good grades to get into high school and which high schools I needed to go to if I wanted to play ball. And my family couldn't afford it, so I had to get some grants and scholarships and financial aid. And then the same was, uh, was true for college because college is pretty good for the food expenses. And, <laughs> and so I, I knew that my family couldn't afford that with three kids. And uh, one, one, like I said, my brother's seven years younger than me, so he was like still in, he wasn't even in high school yet. Right, right. So it was, it was pretty, it was pretty crazy that I had to keep focusing on academics, on staying focused. Uh, pretty much my whole life, my schedule wrapped around church, school, baseball, or or sports, because I did play other sports, too. Um, not, for everybody out there, people always think, like, oh, you didn't play baseball. Not, I'm an athlete. I played all, <laughs> all the major sports. I just knew which one was my was my bread and butter. I knew which one I was the best at. Um, and it, 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 the character, the work ethic that was built from what I was learning and pl- from playing ball, I attributed to a uh, every other area of my life which was like I said with 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 church and my relationship with God because I I always felt guilty if I put so much effort into baseball but didn't do any type of like reading of the Bible or anything so I I would stick with like devotions it's like okay I have to do this today because if I'm going to practice this hard right right this sport I have to do so I have to give God something I mean as a kid I kind of realized that like I mean when you grow up you realize you better give him more sure but, but as a kid I was like I should do something and so it, it it really helps with my own walk because um I think one of the things that my mother 
even taught me one of her favorite things that she would say is, you got to know the Lord for yourself. Ooh. You got to know the Bible yes. for yourself. Yes, definitely. So she was like, I can't bring you into the into heaven. So you, if you, you need to know this stuff for yourself. So I, I, I took ownership of that because I was like, okay. And if I questioned stuff, like my mom and dad would answer, you know, we would have devotionals and Bible studies with the whole family. Now, where, uh, let me, let me yeah. stop you right, jump in right there. <laughs> Cause I'm doing, I've started to do that with my little kids, the four I have at the house yeah. doing daily devotionals mm-hmm. in the morning and before they go to bed at night. And I asked them, you know, do they think it was helpful? Do they think, do they seem to enjoy it? And I'm, from a, a child whose parents did that with them, what did you think of them at the time that you were getting doing the devotions as, as a child? Then, and then right now, as a father of two, what do you think about doing the devotions for your kids and the benefit that it had on you or negative that it had on you? Okay, that's a great question. So at the time, because I'm going to be honest, the Christian so I can't lie. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> wow. At the time, I hated it just because I was like, oh, like, I, I mean, it would take so much longer than just reading it by itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that was like the biggest thing. I was like, oh, I want to, like, I would be like, I want to go outside or I want to watch a show or play some, play video. I don't know. I would come up with, you know, any other thing that we could do. And I mean, looking back at it, when you're a kid, 30 minutes seems like an eternity. Yeah, I did. Unless but you're watching TV or doing what you want to do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So with 30 minutes, it was like, oh, my gosh. And so we would do the daily readings because we did um, the year bi- one-year Bibles and okay. have a devotional on the back side okay. of that. Okay. And we would break down, like, my mom would make sure, my mom and dad would read. Uh, we'd all read a certain um, paragraph or or a portion of the scripture, like a chapter of it, and Mm -hmm. the next person reads the next thing. So the other part about that was, like, I mean, my sister's younger than me, so she doesn't read as fast. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like, like, all this stuff where I was like, ah. But the funny thing is when, um, and so here's the positive part of it. When I was in high school and college, I would find myself being able to quote scripture sometimes oh. not being able to, to put the address there sure you know, let's say what chapter and verse but i would say be able to say well this is what it says in the bible like one of the things i i there was, I, was, I remember a time when i spoke to a kid who was going through some tough and i was like well it does say in the bible it's like peace i leave with you my peace i give to you i do not give to you as the world gives mm. do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid right and and it was just because of the times that we read and the things that my parents did. Like, we also had, um, they had us read, uh, I don't know if they still have this. At night, we would listen to this um, show that uh, I think was called GT. It was like, um, they, they basically sang worship songs that were just Bible verses. Oh, okay, okay. And had like, it was a kid's thing. And it was pretty, and I have also Bible verses just stuck in my head from that, too. So, and it was it's just crazy to how it pops up when you're not expecting it and then you realize oh it does matter it did help wow <laughs> like it's it's deep down in there so it's without me it's like you know how you sometimes you might read something for a reason sure and you're like okay i'm because for instance for a test you're like you're reading this information so you can regurgitate it for a test whereas when you're doing a devotional you don't know what the reason is. You're kind of just like, well, I'm getting it deep down in me. So then all of a sudden, years later, there's an opportunity where you're able to reference it and you didn't even know it was there. So yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, because that test is coming, and, and tests, plural, yes, are coming in our lives. So if you don't study for that test and, and do like the Word says, you know, it says, hide, I will hide your word in my heart so I would not sin against thee. And so yep. it makes sense to do because... It helps. It makes a difference. Now, as your kids get older, I know you have a newborn, and I know you have a mm-hmm. your other child is your other son is how old? Two. Two. So he's probably a little too young, obviously, to do a full on daily devotional with. But as your kids get older, what's your philosophy of your and your wife's? Like, will you be doing a devotional with them, or are you just yeah, kinda... we will be doing a devotional. I think that um, because they have like a lot of different type of devotionals now, mm-hmm. they have like family ones and for younger kids and all sure. that stuff. Whereas my family, we just kind of just did our own. <laughs> it was like straight from the Bible, which was great. Sure. But 
slightly sometimes boring for a kid who's like seven. Especially when you get in those areas when they're just reading just nothing but names and so and so and we got such and oh such. Oh my and... gosh, I'm still there. Sorry for everybody. <laughs> for everybody who's a gat, everyone. Like, I get it. I understand why it's in, in there. Yeah. It's a very historical significance. Sure. Really? <laughs> yeah, some of the names had like, I know, 28 characters, and some of them you couldn't even write and spell, and didn't translate into English, and it was a oh blank. Oh my gosh. Yeah, oh. all the time. I'm always just like, well, we're at this part. <laughs> well, tell me. That's, that's crazy. No, I'm sure my kids are going to laugh at me, because I, I, I have to confess, and again, I'm not trying to make this all about me, but I'm I'm actually writing my devotionals in the morning. So mm-hmm. when I'm reading them to them, sometimes the longer the devotion, you can tell they're starting to, to really not pay attention so it's really helping me as a writer and author to be able to tailor and design certain devotionals for kids and an age appropriate yeah. versus the longer ones for the adult appropriate ones so I'm the Lord's really impressing me to do that so maybe by the time you are looking into your devotions you can consider doing some of mine with your kids we can between you and me and what we're doing with other projects they'll be ready for you to be already tailored that'd be awesome but I do think it's a big deal I think that there's certain things that if you're able to like you said, tailor things to the audience sure. who you're trying to reach. It is way more effective. Well, let's talk about your audience. Now, you said you've played professionally. Yes. And you've got a foundation, obviously, in Christ, and your firm foundation. And, and when you were on the, when you were in college, when you when you were drafted, tell me about when yes. you got drafted, man, and you, and you played for the first time, and then being out there on the road. What's what? what tell me that for. I want to ask too many questions in a row. Tell me about draft day. Uh, draft day was stressful. <laughs> it was extremely stressful because um, you realize that you have a really great opportunity sure. to go play and further your career and your, or further start your career, I should say, because it's not technically a career when you're in college. Um, and you're just like, okay, this could, this, is, this could happen. People are telling you all the time, like, yeah, you're going to get drafted for sure. And so <clears throat> basically how the baseball draft works, there's 50 rounds, which is a lot. Wow. And um, so I was a senior sign because my junior year I had to have shoulder surgery, which knocked me out of the draft because they're like, oh, he's going to have sh- surgery. So it scared people. So my senior year, though, I had another good year, and um, our team had won the conference. So I was like, all right, pretty sure I'm getting drafted. And I, there's rumors out there it was like 5 to 15th round, the 5th to the fi- 15th round. Okay. So I'm like, cool because that's actually where you kind of get some money too so uh-huh. I'm like alright <laughs> okay and um, so I was I'm just waiting and you just you log in you watch like now they have them on TV which is cool because they didn't have that back when I was when I got drafted in 2006 but you would go online and you just kind of watch the draft and just watch and I was watching and watching and then there's two days of the draft the first day goes all the way to the 15th and then they then they stop, and then they do another day uh, where they just do everything else really, really fast. So the first day goes, it comes and goes, and I was like, "What?" And I'm getting phone calls from people just asking, like, "What happened? What were like?" And the funniest part was I'm getting phone calls from like scouts and player, um, the teams and stuff. Like, there's a rumor out there that your shoulders are messed up. You didn't pass this stuff, pass something. I was like, "No, I passed all my physicals." I was like, "What are you talking about?" Like, I'm like, "What rumor is this?" So I'm even more stressed out the second day because I'm like, well, somehow I've dropped uh, and didn't go on the first day. Right. And everybody, and I'm, I'm praying. Like, actually, the funniest part was I'm, I was with my family and we're praying, and uh, we we're like, well, I mean, if God has, if this is God's will, you'll get drafted tomorrow. If it isn't, then there's something else for you to do. Sure. And it was, it was weird because it, it actually gave me some comfort thinking, like, okay. Well, I went to college for a reason, so there's sure. something else. Maybe there is something I'm supposed to do because I have I have the numbers. I was like in the top 50 seniors in in the country. I think I was top 40 actually in the country. Wow! And so I was like, okay, like like maybe it's just I'm not supposed to do this. So I was able to kind of calm myself down. I mean, it was it was a little tougher when. Like, I'd see my teammates and my coaches and people were just kind of talking like, what? Oh, we're so sorry. I don't know. But like, tomorrow it'll happen. But I was like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. You know, and just really calming myself down. So uh, the next day, I don't, I like, I don't even wake up early. I just was like, whatever. <laughs> and, 
and, and so I get up and I'm, I look at my phone and I'm like, did anybody send any messages, text or anything? N- nothing. And so I turn on the um, internet and watch the, where they're at. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're like 25. <laughs> and I was like, and I still haven't gotten anything. And so I was like, well, just got some cereal, sat down and looked at it and just was watching the, um, <coughs> see who was getting picked. And I'm seeing, like, the teams that have reached out to me and called me, uh, even the day before, the Padres had called me up, and they're like, we want to get you. And then the Orioles called me up and said, we're going to get you, in, uh, like, really early. And nothing happened. And so then I'm, like, looking at their, their picks, too, and I'm like, nope, nothing, nothing. Looking at the Giants' picks, because, of course, I'm from San Francisco. I really sure. want to play for the Giants. Home team. And, and they're not getting – and then they pick somebody else, and I'm like, all right. So all of a sudden um, – while I'm watching it. So here's another thing. My first name is Maurice. My middle name is Stefan. So I go I go by my middle name. My dad's first name is Maurice as well, but I'm not a junior. Long story. <laughs> my mom wanted my name to be Stefan. My dad wanted a junior, so they compromised, so I'm Maurice Stefan by trial. Got it. So on, along the line, it pops up. Maurice Gardshell drafted in the 31st round of the Chicago White Sox. And I was at first I was like, who? <laughs> he said, who? <laughs> I was like, my dad got drafted? <laughs> he didn't even think he played anymore, huh? I was going to say, I think he's kind of too old. But uh, that was like the first thing that I saw. And then I realized, I was like, oh, oh, that's me. <laughs> and then, uh, then my parents called. And then right when, I called, right when they called, the White Sox called. So I had to hang up with my parents and talk to the White Sox. And it was like the craziest like emotional shift sure. ever where you're just like looking and you're just like well I guess maybe this won't happen and you're just preparing yourself for the worst and then all of a sudden it happens and you're like wait this is for real like I'm going to keep playing I'm going to get paid like this is for real now tell me about your greatest day for the White Sox what would you, what would you consider to be man this is the best game I ever had for the White Sox my greatest and maybe they're not the same but what was your greatest thing about the White Sox organization so the greatest day, performance-wise, I would say my my greatest performance was um, in Double A. I I think it's two thousand nine, I believe. Um, I broke the record for a single season or a single game RBI. So I wow had yeah I had seven RBIs. I was four for four with um, a three-run homer and a grand slam wow so that was cool <laughs> so, and then i they came up to me like do you realize you just broke the record and i was like nope but now i do <laughs> so, so that was cool that was a lot of fun um now who did you play and, with uh, big time in in uh, the chicago organization who do you remember chicago organization let's see who's who's like super notable now um oh. it was quite a few oh chris bell I don't know why it took that oh, wow. it shouldn't have taken that long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before he got traded to the um, to Boston this year, or he got either traded or free agent signed. I don't know how he's in Boston right now. But um, yeah, Chris Dell, he's he's pretty amazing because when I was playing in the outfield and I would hear him pitch, mm-hmm. like I would see. Him, so I said this on purpose. I'm playing and I could see him pitch, but you can he throws so hard you can hear it. Wow. On the outfield. You hear, and so it was really cool. Like, and his ball is, he's, I am not shocked at how, much, how well of a pitcher he is and why he dominates the way he does. Now, before you go, I want to ask you, what was the deciding factor to make you decide that you wanted to step away from the game? Family, because my wife was pregnant. Um, I had played already one more year uh, after my son Grayson was born. Um, and it was tough because I missed, like, his first steps and everything. Mm-hmm. They had to come out to me for his first birthday because I couldn't go to them. And I was just like, oh, this is really hard. But then I, I just I just was like, I, I'd rather not miss these things um, than try to pursue something that I've already given nine years of my – oh, actually, not even nine years. I've given whew, 20-something years of my yeah, life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, – and I wanted to make sure that I was poured into my son too. So 
I that was one of the biggest factors for me to be home, to be around my family. Now, if I was with the Giants, that would have been different. No. <laughs> <laughs> you might still be playing right now, huh? I was going to say, I would be home. But um, because that didn't work out, <laughs> I was like, I knew that it was the best move for me was to step away. But the other thing was that um, I knew I had another call. Um, and like you said, we're going to get into that in the next segment. segment. Uh, my call was uh, there was a, there was something that I knew I was supposed to be doing that I had planned on doing while I was playing ball that I'd never really got to, which was starting a program to help kids. Okay. And it just with that not really happening, and when when that when how can I put this? When I stepped away from the game, I knew that this is where I was going, and that also made an not an easier transition. It just made it a much more worthwhile transition understanding that okay now i'm following the path that god has for me is it going to be an easy path and i'll tell everybody now that don't hear the next segment it's probably one of the hardest things that i've ever done in my life wow really so yeah so i'll tell them that for sure but the thing is i i I fear the lord more than i fear man Ooh, you better speak on that that'll preach itself so yeah (laughs) So that's the biggest thing. Because of that, if God's giving me something, and like I said earlier, if I don't do it, I'm very afraid of the consequences of that, as opposed to just people seeing and like and speaking to me and be like, oh, I understand why you quit. Oh, I understand why you're doing this. Like, no, I'm not doing this for them. I'm wow. doing this for God. Okay. Well, you've <laughs> been listening to the Raising Men Show with my, my guest, man, Stefan Gartrell. Man, we'd love to have had you. We'll love having you on the show. And we're going to be right back. We're going to get to more of this. And for those who are listening to Raising Men on WKBY at 1080 AM, this is going to be a multi-segment show. So don't go anywhere. We're on the air every Tuesday at 11 AM and 5 PM Pacific time and 2 and 8 PM East Coast time. You're listening to Raising Men with my dad and your host, Craig Carlin, on WKBY 1080 AM. Thank you.